Welcome to Peak City Church and Happy Mother's Day. Moms, thank you so much for all that you do, and we hope that you feel loved and celebrated today. We have a special treat for you. Check it out. Choose your Mother's Day, Mom. We love you so much. You do so much for us, so we wanted to do a little something special for you. Happy Mother's Day. Hi, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Hope you have a great day. Sorry we can't be there with you, but we love you. Love you. Happy Mother's Day. I want to wish a Happy Mother's Day to my sister Morgan, my mother, Linda, and Ember. Happy Mother's Day. Your card's in the mail. Happy Mother's Day, Jeez. Hi, Mom. You're so super. <laughs> super Mom. Hey, Mom. Just want to say Happy Mother's Day for me and Rocky. Hope you have a good day. Hey, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Hi, Mom. Just wanted to say Happy Mother's Day. Your love, your encouragement, and your friendship have always meant so much to me. I love you and hope you have a great day. Hi, Mommy. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. You always make me feel so special. Love you. Bye. Happy Mother's Day, Oma, Nana, and Mom. I hope you have a good, a good Mother's Day. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. Happy, Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. Thank you for helping us learn to ride our bikes. Thank you for always playing Monopoly with me. We, we love you. I want to say happy Mother's Day to my mom, Adina, and to my mother-in-law, Shayla. Thank you for being fantastic moms to us and friends now. And thanks for being great grandmothers to our kids. We, we love, love you. you. Happy, happy Mother's, Mother's Day, Day, Mom. Mom. Thank you so much for everything you do. I love you so much, and I hope today is a great day. Yeah, you're keeping my tail kicks during the coronavirus, keeping me responsible for everything. So, you do a lot for us. Love you. Love you too. Happy Mother's Day to Ann Cartrett, one of the greatest moms on the earth and an amazing wife. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and our family for being an amazing mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day! I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. You want to say I love you, Nate? To all the moms out there, we just want to say Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! To my mom, Joyce Sizza. And to my mom, Donna Mariner, we want to say again, Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Day. Yeah, Good morning, Peak City Church. Happy Mother's Day. Let's worship together. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. An echo in my soul. says to me now there's no stopping where you have started until it is complete when my mind says I'm not good enough God you're enough for me I've decided I'm not giving up you won't give up on me you won't give up on me Love is holding on and it won't let go. 
church. Let's lift him up together. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. Be moved when the earth gives way, for the risen one is overcome, and for every fear, there's an empty grave. shouts with the voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way.
In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To reveal the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died
Hey everyone, thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving. It's been an awesome week to see God at work in and through the life of this church. We've had people giving their lives to Christ during the week this week, new members in the family of God, people from Peak City Church going into homes and helping to make repairs where people couldn't otherwise do those things. And we love seeing God continue to build his kingdom and use his people to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Your giving directly impacts our ability to do that. So as we worship God with our giving, we have several ways we can do that today. If you'd like to take your phone out, you can actually worship God with your giving through our website. If you go to peakcity.church forward slash give, you can give safely and reliably there. You can actually text to give at 919-373-3131 if you text the word give to that number and give that way. Or you can get the app which is available for iOS and Android if you search Peak City Church in your app store. You'll be able to download the Peak City Church app and all three of those ways you can give safely and reliably. If you don't do any of the digital stuff, you can always mail a check in if it's written to Peak City Church. Mail that into P.O. Box 723, Apex, North Carolina, 27502. Thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to be faithful to support God's vision for Peak City Church. Now let's check out these announcements. Hello church family, welcome to all of you on this Mother's Day Sunday. I'm Mitch Cartrett. I'm the Next Gen Pastor. And I'd like to invite each of you to head on over to our website, peakcity.church. There's an online connect card. Maybe you have some prayer requests or you just want more information about the church. We'd love to be able to follow up with you later this week. Again, happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Hope you're having a great day, being loved on by your family and everything. Hey, you still have time for mom's best dress. Just post your pic to social media with the hashtag Peak City Best Dressed. And we'll be deciding the winner a little bit later this evening, I believe around 6 p.m. So you still have time, do that. It's gonna be a great prize to the winner. And let's just have fun with that and celebrate moms. Go ahead and pull out your cell phone and go to Facebook. And we wanna do those check-ins to Peak City Church because for every Facebook check-in you do, we donate $2 to local food pantries in the local community. And that helps to feed displaced kids and you truly do make a difference. So thank you for all the check-ins you've been doing lately. Well, how many of you got to participate in our stay-at-home date night cooking class a few weeks ago? I know me and my family got to do that and it was just a great time. We had a lot of fun. There's a lot of people on Zoom participating. So by popular demand, we're doing another stay-at-home date night cooking class with our chef, Colin Boggs, and now we even have his teacher, Chef Brian Wilson. This is going to be provided for you on May 22nd at 6.30 p.m. We'd love for you to invite your friends, some neighbors, maybe invite family members. It's just a fun time to learn something new and to participate in this cooking class. You just simply need to register by emailing office at Peak City Church. We can't wait to see you on that cooking class. We're having a drive-through supply drive at Peak City HQ coming up on May 26th from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. You'll see a list there of the supplies and everything that you need. And it's just a great opportunity for us to be the church and be generous in our community and, and supply food and other supplies for those in need. So thank you for your generosity. So now let's head on back to our worship celebration.
Well, hey, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there and to all the ladies that are a mother figure to somebody. So excited to have you joining with us for Church Online, all of you today. We're excited to have you. My name is Nate. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Hey, moms, don't forget our opening Mother's Day video was not the only way that we're celebrating you today. We have a best dress contest for all moms. If you'll use the hashtag Peak City Best Dressed and post a picture of yourself in whatever best dress means to you, online today, uh, or if you don't do any social media stuff, you can email it to office at peakcity.church. By the end of the day today, by 6 p.m., we're going to select a winner of the Best Dress Contest, and one lucky lady is going to win an incredible spa package. We're going to support local businesses, uh, and maybe you're watching from somewhere else on the other side of the country. Well, then we'll find uh, a place to be able to give you your prize as well locally for you, but it's going to be a spa package for some pampering once businesses reopen in the area that you live in to celebrate you today. So don't forget, use that hashtag, Peak City Best Dressed, whether that's you in your, your power suit because you're the one that's running that company. Maybe it's you in your super mom apron because you're multitasking all around the house. Or maybe it's you when you say, I am at my best when I'm in my most comfortable sweatpants. Whatever best dress looks like for you, you get a photo and put it online for us and we'll pick a winner. Hey, so we've been in a series called Waymaker, and we've been studying the miracles of Jesus in the book of John. And so we're at the sixth sign in the book of John this week. And if you'd like to catch other messages in this series, you can head over to our website, peakcity.church forward slash messages, and you can hear the other installments of Waymaker. And this particular week, we're not just looking at something that shows God's power, but we're looking at a miracle that really shows us the character of God. And it's gonna break down misconceptions that people had then, and to this day, people still have about God when they say, why in the world do things like this happen all around us if there's a God? Well, there's gonna be some clarity given to some really hard questions like that today. But I do wanna say this too. Whatever your assumptions are about God, the only way that you can truly get to know who he is is if you study the life of Jesus. The only way that you get to know God's heart is to listen to God's son, to read what he said and how he acted and his compassion towards people. To see God's heart, you have to see Jesus. Don't base your opinion of God or your viewpoint on who he is based on what somebody else has told you, not even what I've told you. Read it for yourself. Get into the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read about who Jesus is. Because if you want to know God, you've got to know Jesus. So we're going to pray, and we're going to jump into God's word, okay? Father, I ask that you would open our ears to be able to hear, our minds to understand, and open the eyes of our hearts to be able to see you, God, for who you truly are. And I pray that for so many of us that have just accepted a lie about you, that today you would replace the lie with your truth, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, so we're gonna be in John chapter nine today, so if you've got your Bible, you can start reading with me in John chapter nine, verse one. I'm gonna be reading from the ESV, and if you don't have your physical Bible in your hand, that's okay. You can see the words right there on the screen as well. So John chapter nine, verse one, it says, as he passed, he saw a blind man from birth. This is Jesus as he passed. Verse two, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So give you some context here. Jesus had just left the temple treasury. He left this area called the Court of the Women. There were some people that wanted to stone him, and he escapes undetected. And most likely, when he's walking past this man born blind, he's going past one of the gates of the city because there was no welfare system in those days, and people that had disabilities would often go to the areas that were highly trafficked by people, and they would beg, and they would ask for help, and that was their only means of income was just to sit by a high traffic area of people and ask for money. And so this was a man born blind that people probably knew. He had been there begging as long as he was old enough to do that on his own. And so they had an idea of who this guy was. And the disciples made an assumption. They assumed of him because he was born blind that somebody did something wrong. You know, and the assumption that they had was one that we have to this day, that bad things are a result of sin. And if something bad happens in your life, it's because you sinned. 
And in this particular case, it was either because he sinned or his parents sinned. And you might say, well, no, he was born blind. How could he sin? There was a belief back in those days that you could sin inside the womb somehow. And so they were asking the question, who sinned? Was it his parents? Was it him? And a lot of us to this day, we ask questions about ourselves. We say, is God punishing me now for something I did long ago? And for a lot of you watching today, you may even look at it like this. You might say, is God punishing me through the suffering of my children for something that I did a long time ago? And like I said, this is gonna give us, this miracle is gonna give us a picture of who God truly is. Because while the disciples were saying, Jesus, who made this mess? Was it this guy or was it his parents? Jesus looks back at them and says, neither. Jesus makes this profound statement to us that gives us an incredible truth about God. Jesus, he isn't interested in helping you figure out others' mess as much as he's interested in fixing it. That's who he is. And Jesus answers his disciples. Verse three, it says, it was not this man that sinned or his parents. And so Jesus is saying it was neither of them. It's not anybody's fault. This is not the result of sin. In fact, he goes on. He says, it was not this man that sinned or his parents. He continues. He says, but that, and Jesus is, is using a connecting statement here. So it's kind of like saying, so that. He's saying, but that. So Jesus is about to show us something that we have not seen or conceived that in the time when this miracle took place, the mentality and the view of God had never even thought this to be a possibility. Jesus sets it up because he's gonna show us that our pain actually has a purpose. He says that this was done, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This was completely unheard of. All they knew about God was that if somebody had pain or infirmity or struggle or was born with a disability or was gone on hard times or couldn't get a job, couldn't feed their family, was home, pain was a punishment from God. And that is all they knew. But God was showing us something through his son that they had never seen before. Showing them that God sometimes chooses to display his power through our pain. And look, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at this miracle and I'm gonna give us some takeaways and that's the first one. I just wanna show us four takeaways about who God truly is and then we're done. But the first one I want you to know is that God chooses to display his power through our pain. In other words, what, what God is saying to you in the struggle that you may be in is that God wants you to invite him in to your pain. The reason he wants you to invite him in to your pain is to be able to show his strength that's working through you and not just show his strength. He wants to strengthen you and show you that you have more strength in you that he's put there than you thought you had. He wants to give you endurance. He wants to show you that as he strengthens you that he's gonna give you the ability to move day by day by day without faltering and failing, that he's gonna see you through. He wants you to invite him into your pain so that he can mature you. The most difficult times of our lives are the ones that cause us to grow the most, the ones that cause us to appreciate what we have the most. In other words, when you were in the place where you knew that all you had was Jesus, but he's all you needed, and then he brought you through it, you still look back into those places and say, he's all I need right now. And you don't forget his goodness. And you don't forget what he's done to sustain you. See, what immaturity does is it just whines and complains when things aren't good. And when they are, they completely forget about the God that carried them through. But what pain does, and when God gets invited into that pain, is it causes us to, to grow in our maturity and understanding of the God that sees us through every day. And we celebrate him in the good times and we celebrate him in the difficult times. Not only does it do that, but when we invite God into our pain, it's also gonna be something where God will reward you. You know, what does he say? Blessed are those who suffer, what? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And God is completely reworking people's mindsets. He's deconstructing these old mindsets that say pain is just a result of sin. Pain is God's punishment. And he's saying, no, no, no. There's a greater purpose that God will use in the midst of pain. You say, well, that, that doesn't sound fair. Okay, you know what? Jesus suffered as well. 
And his suffering had nothing to do with his sin, did it? In fact, it was all because he was taking your sin and putting it upon himself. Let's continue. Verse four, it says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Verse six, having said these things, <laughs> he spit on the ground. I can't make this stuff up. This is what happened. He said, I am the light of the world. <sighs> yeah, I'm sorry if that was loud on the camera, um, but it's supposed to be. This is literally what happened. He said, I'm the light of the world. And then he hawks up a loogie and spits into the ground. Verse six, it says he spit on the ground and he made mud with his saliva. <laughs> and then... This guy, you got to imagine, the man born blind is standing right beside the disciples that are asking this question. And he's not deaf. Like, he, he knows that they're talking about him. He hears people talking about him all the time. And then Jesus, you know, he says, yeah, it, it, this didn't happen to him because of sin. Imagine how he felt hearing that from Jesus. And then the next thing he hears is Jesus talking to Belugi, spitting on the ground. And then he feels something wet on his face. <laughs> And like he's got, Jesus is rubbing spit mud on his eyes. And verse six says, then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so he went and washed and then he came back seeing. I want to give you some context here. It's a good time for that. Uh, so Jesus came to Jerusalem in John chapter seven. He came for a feast. And during this time, for him to heal a blind man by rubbing like mud spit in his eyes and telling him to, to go from where they were to wash, it was probably about a half a mile walk down the busiest colonnade there, or the busiest street, I should say, um, in that part of the city, for him to go down to the pool of Siloam to wash. About a half a mile walk. So this blind man's bumping into everybody, and he's mud-faced, and everybody sees him. I mean, equate it to like, you know, you're watching Christian television in the 80s, and Tammy Faye Baker starts crying. Mascara everywhere. I mean, just mess all over his face, and everybody is seeing this as he's walking to this pool to wash. And you just say, this is just the strangest thing that Jesus would do this. And you say, why mud? Like, why dirt? I think it's because dirt represents our humanity. I mean, we were created from the dust of the earth. You know, we know this all the way from back in Genesis to now. Psalm 103 verse 14 reminds us that, that we're dust. You think about the shame of the sinful woman that was caught in adultery. And I, that's a whole other sermon I could preach right there. She was drugged naked into the streets because she was caught in an affair and they were about to stone her and they brought Jesus out and they said, the law says we can kill her for what she's done. And what does Jesus do? He, he gets down, he kneels down and he begins to draw in the dirt. See, the dirt, it represents our, our humanity. And a lot of you just feel like, you know what? I, I am a mess and my life's just a mess and I feel like I can't keep spinning the plates all the time. Listen, you were, you were made from dust, of course your life is messy. All of our lives are messy. And for the people that try to keep their lives perfectly controlled and airtight as much as possible, this season is about to wreck somebody. I want you to know today that you were created from the dust of the earth, so of course you are messy. Psalm 103, 14 says, for he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Now, I don't know if this story is true or not, but it's funny. So I'm going to tell it. Uh, there was a child that was in church with her family, a little girl, and they went to one of these, you know, high church, liturgical type churches, and the priest or the pastor that was up front was praying this prayer, and he was like, oh, gracious heavenly Father, thou art worthy of all the praise of man in both heaven and earth. Though we are but dust, thou art the great God and ruler of all the cosmos. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. And the little girl hears this, this really lofty prayer and she leans over to her mother and she says, Mama, what is butt dust? All right, you can laugh at it if you want to, but I thought it was funny. We are butt dust. And you can put whatever emphasis on whatever sil syllable you want to on that particular phrase. And I think we need to remember this because we always try to cover up our dirt, don't we? Moms, I want you to know this today on this Mother's Day, that God has seen you without makeup. And you don't have to cover yourself up in front of him. 
In fact, I think that this miracle is showing us that sometimes Jesus just wants us to see the mud. And I think that sometimes God wants us to let other people see the mud. He wants to see us showing a genuine person to somebody else out there. Showing someone that it's okay to struggle sometimes because we might be in the struggle and in the midst of our pain, if we invite God into it, he's gonna see us through it. And that they can have hope to know that even though they're going through the same kind of struggle that they were embarrassed about, that they wanted to cover up, that they can see someone else that's bold enough to say, "Mm -mm, it's not just you. Sometimes God wants us to let other people see the mud. I think this could be even said better if we say it this way. Some of the most meaningful moments in our lives are the messiest. Embrace it. Embrace the mess. I mean, you know, like, for instance, like my backyard, um, it's, it's a mud pit. We talk about this all the time. And I don't look at my backyard and get upset that I don't have grass. In fact, I do have some now. We planted it. And I am just enjoying watching my kids stomp that little bit of grass into oblivion. Uh, the other day, you know, my son, he was standing with me and I have an offset smoker and I was, I was smoking some venison. I like to do that sort of redneck stuff. And there's this dirt hill by a tree in my backyard and he was standing there looking at it. And he started squatting down and I thought that he might be, you know, this might be a number two moment. So I was just gonna let him have his privacy and do his thing. But that wasn't the case. He was thinking something and all of a sudden he says, daddy, Watch this. And he puts his arm by his, arms by his side and he does a straight up penguin slide down the dirt hill on his belly. Doesn't roll over, doesn't scorpion where his feet flip over his head. Slits, he just slides down, he turns around, looks at me and smiles and said, Daddy, I did it. I thought that was awesome. And he was filthy. But I don't let my kids get out in the yard and play and say, you gotta keep it clean. No, I want them to get out there and enjoy the dirt a little bit sometimes. Because when you're enjoying life, and you're embracing the mess, some of your best and most meaningful moments can take place. You got stuff piling up. Yeah, you and everybody else. You're like, I can never get these dishes cleaned. You know what? That's right, because you're not alone, and you have people that are doing life together, and they're eating, and, and you're having to reload and unload the dishwasher, and all that. That's, that's a part of life. That's a blessing. The scripture says it this way, Proverbs 14, 4. Where there are no oxen, the manger's clean. But abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. In other words, you know, yeah, there's no mess in the stable if there's no ox there to make a mess. But if things are getting done, stuff gets messy. Do you know why you have a to-do list that never gets done? It's simple. It's because you're not dead. Embrace it. You gotta embrace the mess and understand that God is gonna see you through. All right, let's jump back into our text here. Verse eight. It says, the neighbors and those who had seen him before, the blind man, as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. And others said, no, but, but he's like him. And he kept saying, the blind man kept saying, I am the man. And so they said to him, then how are your eyes opened? And he answered, I love this. He says, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Salome and wash. So I went and I washed and I received my sight. And then, I love this, they, they ask a really stupid question. And this is classic. They said, at verse 12, they said to him, where is he? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. I didn't see which way he went. Captain Obvious, that may or may not be in the Bible in that last part there. So <laughs> moving on. So they had a rule when a miracle took place, you had to go to the priest and the priest had to verify that a miracle had taken place. And this was a true custom for them. Not some Nate Mariner embellishment there. So they went to the Pharisees and they brought this man who was born blind that can now see. And verse 13 says, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day. Don't forget that because that's what's gonna get all up in the Pharisees' crawl. That's just gonna be a thorn in their side right now because you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. That's breaking God's rules. And the Pharisees say, I understand God. I know all the rules. God works in this little box that we put him in with all these rules and those rules can't be broken. So you can't heal on the Sabbath if you're from God. Verse 14, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Verse 15, so the Pharisees again asked him, asked the man born blind, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes. 
I washed and I see. And some Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. They're saying this about Jesus. He's not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Now I'm gonna call this next section as we walk through the miracle here, the bad theology section, because the first thing that we see is this bad theology that they believe, the Pharisees believe this, that God rests once a week. They think that because God created the entire universe and on the seventh day he rested, that means he rests every seventh day. And that because he told man that they need to rest one day a week, that God must do the same thing. Yet Jesus himself tells us in John 5, again, if you want to know God, you've got to know Jesus. If you want to know who God is, I can't say this enough, you've got to know who Jesus is. Jesus said it in John 5. He said, my father is always at work, and so I'm working too. He says he's the Lord over the Sabbath, right? So let's continue. So bad theology right there. God rests once a week. No, he doesn't. God, God is always working. Continue in the scripture here. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? So all of a sudden they're divided. The Pharisees are saying, guy's not from God. And then other people in the crowd are like, no, 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 no. He healed somebody. How can someone who's a sinner do something like this? And there was division among them. Verse 17. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And this is not an educated guy. You've got to remember, he spent his life begging by a city gate just to survive. He said, I don't know. He's a prophet. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. In other words, they didn't believe any of the testimony of this guy, and they said, get your mom and dad in here. Let's see if they say that you were born blind. Verse 19, it says, and they asked them, the Pharisees asked the parents, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he's gonna speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed. They'd already made up their mind. They already decided about Jesus, that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, that he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. And the reason they did that is because what they were threatening. Remember, when it says the Pharisees threatened to throw anyone that followed Jesus out of the synagogue, that they were gonna be excommunicated from the Jewish faith, that everything they knew about their life, their society, their, their friends, their family, forgiveness of sins and the rituals that the Jews followed, all that was gone. Basically, the, the Pharisees were saying, we're going to condemn you, we're gonna damn you to hell if you follow Jesus. This is a serious, serious charge. And so they feared the, the Pharisees for that very reason. Verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. All right, so the Pharisees said, give glory to God, to the blind man. Praise God, but don't give it to Jesus. They're saying, because we know that Jesus is a sinner, because he doesn't fit into the box. He healed somebody on the Sabbath. And we know how the rules go. You can't do that because you're breaking the rules and God doesn't break the rules that he makes. He has to abide by the rules. And the Pharisees believe they could manipulate God based on those rules to benefit themselves. And a lot of us do that same thing to this day. We think that God just needs to obey and do what we need him to do. And we forget that we are the sheep of his pasture. Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 25, this young man that had been healed of a affliction that he had his entire life gets this moment. He wasn't educated, but he gets to speak profoundly into the lives of you and me and everyone for thousands and thousands of years until the Lord comes back when he said this very thing. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know, but one thing I do know Though I was blind, now I see. And for many of us, we were given something in that moment by God. We were given the ability to believe 
in God, even though we didn't understand everything about him. And I want you to know that right now. You don't have to have all the boxes checked. You don't have to understand everything about who God is to be able to put all of your faith and your hope and your trust in him. If I walk into a skyscraper and I take an elevator to the top floor, I don't have to understand everything about how that steel structure went up and the hydraulics of that elevator that got me to the top, but I do need to have enough faith to believe that it's gonna support me while I'm up there, right? In the same way God would say this to you, you don't have to understand everything to believe, but you can believe. Verse 26, let's continue. They said to him, what did he do to you? <laughs> they ask him again. How did he open your eyes? There's a lot of repetitive uh, speech going on here. Verse 27, he answered them, I have told you already and you did not, you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And then all of a sudden it dawns on him. He's like, oh, do you want to become his disciples too? Remember, he's not being curt with them. He's not being sarcastic. He's not a super educated guy, but he's trying to figure out why they keep asking. And he says, oh, do you want to become his disciples too? And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. And so he's, he's like, buckle in. I'm gonna give you every detail of this one more time because again, this young man's thinking they, they really wanna hear about how Jesus did this so they could follow him too. And he says, you do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. And we know that God does not listen to sinners, more bad theology there, but anyone who is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Again, we're in the bad theology section. So not only does God rest once a week, mm -mm, that's completely false. But he also says God doesn't hear sinners' prayers. Well, I thank God. I thank God that he heard mine when I was a young boy by my bedside, a sinner, asking for God's mercy and grace because he heard my prayer and he saved my soul. And I want you to hear this today. No matter how far you think you are from God, God hears your prayers. Speak to him. It's not like they're bouncing off the ceiling and you can't out God's love or his grace. And I want you to hear that today. There's more bad theology. They said God doesn't hear sinners' prayers. Verse 32, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is the blind man saying this. And then the Pharisees answered him. They answered him saying, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us. There's more bad theology. More bad theology. Remember, that's the bad theology that says that your pain is God punishing you. It's just bad theology. No, God, God wants to use your pain. God wants to give your pain a purpose. The people that are the most inspiring people that we see in the world are the ones that have been through great affliction and trial, and yet they have a faith and a belief in God that gives us passion to follow God too. Because if they can endure and go through that, wow, what an inspiration that is for us, right? So don't believe that lie that your pain is God punishing you. That's just bad theology. The scripture continues, it says, and they, the Pharisees, cast him out. You see, I think one of the takeaways that God gives us here from this miracle and shows us something that is just so, so beautiful for us is that God shows mercy in spite of bad theology. It doesn't matter how much we misunderstand him. He shows us mercy. Now, that's not very true of human beings, is it? When somebody misrepresents you, you don't feel all warm and fuzzy inside and ready to forgive them, do you? Mm -mm. No, 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 you wanna declare war. Even worse, if someone starts trashing your kids and speaks ill about your children, you don't just wanna go to war. Now, you, you, wanna, you wanna scorch the earth with somebody, don't you? And yet our heavenly father saw this very thing happening to his son, beaten, mocked, scorned, nailed to a cross. And yet God shows his mercy to us. See, God shows mercy in spite of bad theology. The Pharisees, they, they were so concerned about all the rules and that Jesus didn't follow the Sabbath. Remember Mark 2, 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. I love this, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus is saying, you guys, you're getting this all wrong. It's like you think that the law was created and then God went, you know what? We should make some people so they can follow all these rules. That'd be a great idea. It's ridiculous, right? That's like you saying, you know what? We should have some kids so we have somebody to clean up all these toys in the living room. 
It makes no sense, but this is what religion does. It tries to get a system and say, okay, God, you have to follow this system, and that's what you have to do. In fact, back in those days, they thought that, that God, you know, every time you sinned, it didn't matter. As long as you sacrificed an animal, your sin would be forgiven. And they thought, that's the loophole. I can live however I want to. I'll just keep on sacrificing animals to God. And that's why in Isaiah, the Holy Spirit speaks through the prophet Isaiah, and God says to the people, I hate your sacrifices. How many more animals have to die? How much more fat are you going to burn on an altar and think that somehow that gets you off the hook? God's saying, you don't play me. You can't, it's not like you use my rules against me. I know your heart. And this is what he's trying to say to us today. That even though we don't understand his heart, he shows us mercy. And the Pharisees that were trying to make all the rules bend in their favor were getting reschooled by Jesus. Jesus makes it clear that God's mercy is greater than our theology. And that's what it means for us today that we need to adopt mercy as a priority in our life. In other words, when you think someone is outside the bounds of God's mercy, you're believing wrong. Like if your theology in your heart and mind says that there's somebody that's beyond the reach of his grace, you're believing wrong. If your belief allows you to abuse somebody, I would say that you're guilty not only of bad theology, but you're guilty of bad behavior too. And that is sin. And you need to repent of that. If your belief shuts people out of God's mercy, you're believing wrong. And see, this is exactly what the Pharisees were trying to do. And this is what Jesus was saying, this is not, this is not what I do. Because it shows us again, not just that God extends mercy to us even though we get it wrong, even though we don't fully understand him. This miracle also shows us something that I, I really want to rest in your heart right now. It's that you matter. It's that individual people matter to God. That he knows you by name. That he set this example just like in this story and every other time you see him healing somebody. I mean, he could have spoken and healed entire crowds of people. He could have just blown and waved his hand and done it. That's not what he did. Remember when he fed the multitudes as we studied just a few weeks back, he had just had an emotional wreck hit him. Found out that John the Baptist, his cousin, one of his closest friends was murdered in a prison by King Herod. And then the emotional toll of that was so heavy. He wanted to get away with his disciples and kind of decompress with them a little bit. But then there was this huge crowd of people that followed him. And what did Jesus do? Did he say, I don't have time? No. Did he say, I can't even right now? No. Did he say, my anxiety and stress is just too high. I just need a minute. No, he did not. It says that he had compassion on them and he ministered to them and he healed their diseases and he did it one by one by one by one. Jesus chose to heal one person at a time. That means that you matter. That means that the individual person matters to God. That God sees you in your pain and that he wants you to invite him into your pain so that he can show you the purpose for it and do something incredible through you. Verse 35 emphasizes that point. It says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. I love it. And having found him, Jesus went looking for him because individuals matter. He said to him, do you believe in the son of man? And the blind man answered, and who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? In other words, he said, you, whatever you say, you tell me who the son of man is and I'll believe it. After what you've done, I'll believe whatever you're saying. Verse 37, Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Don't forget that God chooses to display his power through our pain. Don't forget that some of the most meaningful moments of our lives are oftentimes the messiest. We got to embrace the mess. That God shows mercy in spite of our bad theology and that people matter. Individual people matter to God. Just be reminded that God loves you and that he didn't just come to wash you clean on the outside. He came to make you new. He wants you to know that you can be transformed by his power and his presence. And maybe you're one of the ones that's had a mindset that said, oh, some of those people can't, can't be reached. And God's saying, it's time to change your mindset. It's time to repent of that. 
you might have grown up in church all your life and you might be, as I like to say, lost as a redneck in Starbucks just because you've been checking boxes, but you've never actually learned who Jesus is. You've never actually invited Jesus into your heart and life to be your savior and allowed him to transform you into something new. I used to use this illustration all the time in youth ministry. I used to say this, just because you're standing in a McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac. Just because you're in a, car, in a garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you're swimming in water doesn't make you a fish. And some of you might say, well, Pastor Nate, that's a false equivalence. It's a logical fallacy in which an equivalence is drawn between two subjects based on flaws or false reasoning. Number one, I want you to know God loves you. Number two, it may not be as much of a false equivalence as you think, because for that illustration to work, something has to be completely transformed. And that is what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to give you a new paint job to make you look better. He didn't come to slap some makeup on a tired face. He came to make you new. And if you wanna put all your faith and trust in him today, you can. If on this Mother's Day, you wanna invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You may not know everything about him, but you know enough to put all your hope and your faith in him. Today could be the day where he makes you a brand new creation. Can we pray together? Jesus, I'm asking that you would simply speak your truth into hearts right now. And for somebody, that they would take a bold, bold step of faith. Right now, while you're praying in homes, wherever you're watching this from, if you're ready to make a decision to follow Jesus, why don't you click the button on Church Online right now that says, I'm raising my hand because I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus. I want, I want Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. I'm gonna ask him for his forgiveness. I'm gonna ask him to make me new. And you can respond right now on Church Online by doing that. And if you're ready to take that step, why don't you pray a prayer that sounds something like this because he hears you. Jesus hears you. Jesus, I need you to forgive me. I'm turning away from my past and I'm turning towards you. I believe that you died on the cross for me and you did that to pay for my sin. And because you were raised to life again from death, I believe that you can raise me to life as well. And I'm praying that you, God, would put a new spirit in me, that you would transform me and my spirit from this dead thing that's inside of me to being alive and alive in you. I give you my heart and my life. Be my savior, my Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we'd love to hear about it. We're so glad you joined with us today to worship with us at Church Online. God bless you. Let us know how you're doing. Email us at office at peakcity.church. We'd love to be able to help minister to you and hear the good things that God's doing in your life during this whole process. Until I can see you again, take care. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We love getting to worship with you. I'd like to invite you to head on over to our website and fill out an online connect form so we can know who you are and how we can be praying for you this week, or if you have any other needs. And if God has laid it on your heart to financially support the ministry of Peak City Church, you can head over to our website at peakcity.church forward slash give. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you.